Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming to the second seminar of Thinking Space. Um, we have Dr. Natalie Pearson here from Sydney Southeast Asian Center. She will be presenting about the shipwrecks in Indonesia, uh, in Indonesia particularly in Belitung. Um, so Dr. Natalie Pearson is also affiliated with the discipline of archaeology. Um, Uh, she is a critical heritage studies scholar with particular interest in Asia's maritime heritage. Natalie's first book, Blitu, which we have circulated here, The Afterlives of Shipwreck, was published by University of Hawaii Press this year. And Natalie is also a president of the Indonesia Council, which has an upcoming um, conference, Indonesian Conference Open, uh, which we are part of, <laughs> um, and also a counselor of the Australi Australasian Institute of Maritime Archaeology and an expert member of the ECOMOS International Committee on Archaeological Heritage Management. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> so thanks for coming here and we are um, eager to listen about your presentation. Are you able to share the slides on the screen, please? Thank you. Are they coming up okay for you on the Zoom? Yep, looks good. Excellent. Good, thank you. Well, I thought given this is um, a thinking space seminar that I would call my seminar Thinking with Shipwrecks. Um, so thank you, uh, Uni, for inviting me and also Bob, um, it's really lovely to be here. Uni and I are working on the Indonesia Council Open Conference together. I recruited her as our postgraduate coordinator, so she's helping us out a lot with that big conference. So I'm very happy to come along and speak at your seminar. Um, so as Uni mentioned, I'm a critical heritage studies scholar. I work at Sydney Southeast Asia Centre. So um, some of you will have heard of it, but Kevin and F have you heard of it as well? That's excellent, that's really great. So we're one of the MDIs at the university. Um, and I've had lots of exposure to geography um, through my work at SEAC, especially the field schools working with Jeff. So, um, yeah, as I said, I've always considered myself slightly geography curious. Um, so Bob and Uni asked me to talk about my new book, and there's a copy over there if you'd like to pass it around. And the book is about a 9th century shipwreck called the Blutung. Um, not Belitung, which is how most Australians pronounce it, um, but actually Blutung is the island, um, Billiton Island, where BHP got its name from. They were originally there mining tin. So it kind of sounds like Billiton, but it's Blutung. Um, so I wanted to use um, my talk about Blutung as a way um, of introducing some new ideas about shipwrecks uh, and use it as a point of departure for thinking more critically about maritime heritage and to go beyond the usual tropes of romance and treasure and tragedy and to instead situate wrecks within the context of issues as diverse and pressing as deep sea extraction, uh, multi-species justice and the rising tide of geoculture. So I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes, is that right? And should be time for questions at the end. And I apologise, I've been running across campus, so I'm still, <laughs> I'm still cooling down. Okay, so I asked um, ChatGPT to generate a list of terms that we associate with shipwrecks. And this is what it came up with. It was really fun. It's the first time I've used ChatGPT. Um, and you can see here it's really romance inflected. There's mystery and treasure and pirates and all that kind of thing. Um, so you can be very specific with ChatGPT. So I asked it to generate a list that was less romance inflected. And this is what it came up with. <laughs> Sorry. So this is the unhappy part of shipwrecks. Disaster, tragedy, loss, death, decay, graves at sea. Um, so it really is a very evocative bullet point list. It was excellent. Okay, but what I'm interested in, I can do it. Thank you. Um, in, what I'm interested in is what shipwrecks can tell us uh, about all these things that I've, I've put here on the right. This is my own list. This is not chat GPT generated. So I'm interested in what they can tell us about social and economic inequality, about class and race privilege, um, questions of human rights and bodily autonomy. Uh, I'm interested in the militarisation of the oceans. That's how we found Titanic, actually, through a naval expedition. Uh, and the push to extract resources from the ocean, um, including marine life, shipwreck cargoes, uh, rare minerals, uh, some of these resources that we're extracting. 
Um, shipwrecks can also tell us about territorial demarcation and claim making at sea. Um, just need to look at the South China Sea for an example. Um, about rising, warming and acidifying oceans. About governance and the questions around what is legal versus what is ethical at sea. And how this concept of exploration, going further, higher, deeper, puts humans at the centre, despite all the damage that this has done to our world thus far. There are different geographies of empathy at play at sea. The politics of who deserves a, uh, our care and our attention and who doesn't is inflected in and by the ocean. And of course, for me, working in a Southeast Asian context, the geopolitics of maritime heritage in a contested region with a complex and uneven landscape of legislation and politics, especially in relation to the ocean. In framing my talk around these issues, I want to propose a new way of thinking about shipwrecks as capable of telling us about the world that we live in, not only in the past, but also now in the present and the world we want to live in in the future. So with that in mind, let's talk about Blue Tong, the shipwreck and the book. And I think I have to you know, be upfront. I think my book starts to think about these issues, but it's only the very beginning. Um, so, you know, I'm continuing to develop my thinking since I've written the book and I'm proud of it, but there's still a lot of thinking to go. So I'm going to tell you about, um, the, there's, the, there's the, the cover. So I'm going to tell you about the book, um, how I came to write it, the questions it addresses and the methodology it uses, my main findings, what it left out, um, the significance as I see it, and wrap up by offering some thoughts on thinking with shipwrecks as a way of exploring some of these bigger issues. So because it's a geography seminar, I'm starting with a map. <laughs> Will you accept me now, please? <laughs> okay, so there are three million ancient shipwrecks in the world, according to UNESCO estimates. And if you've been to any of my talks, I often start with this statistic because it is quite mind boggling. So my book is about just one of them. Um, I think, can you see the... See that? Yeah, you can. Okay, so here's Bulutong Island. Um, down here is Java, is Jakarta, Sumatra. Um, Singapore's up here to the north. Um, but you get this sense of um, Bangka Bulutong, these two islands, the Bangka Bulutong province, sort of triangulated here by Sumatra, Java, and Borneo, um, here in the Java Sea, basically. Uh, and so the Bulutong shipwreck was found here. And um, these are a couple of other uh, well-known shipwrecks found in the area, the Bacau, the Intan and the Chiribon. But we're going to be talking about the Blutong today. Um, so it's a Western Indian Ocean style vessel and this means it was made in a style commonly used in the Western Indian Ocean. Um, it's commonly said in the literature that it was constructed in Oman or Yemen, but more recent research on the timbers and the organic materials used to construct the vessels suggest that it might not have been made in Oman or Yemen, possibly India. There's even talk of it being made um, in um, Myanmar or Malaysia. So basically we don't know where it was made, but it was made in this Western Indian Ocean style. And that means that it was stitched together using young coconut fiber. Um, the planks were sewn together and not a single dowel or nail was used in the construction. Um, and then it was rendered on the inside with probably goat fat or something like that to keep it um, watertight. So it would have been super smelly on the inside. Um, so it was found here in Indonesia in 1998, um, which is the year that Suharto fell from power. That was in May 98 that um, the dictator Suharto fell from power after 30 years uh, as president of Indonesia. And the salvage licence for this shipwreck was issued in August, so it was shortly after Suharto fell from power. Now, interestingly, it was found with Tang Dynasty, so Chinese ceramics, on board. So we have this vessel made in the Western Indian Ocean style in Indonesian waters, um, Indonesian territorial waters, uh, with Chinese ceramics. At a time in Indonesia where, you know, China, Chinese people were being racially vilified, um, so there wasn't a lot of interest in this, um, this shipwreck when it was first discovered. But as it turned out, it was one of the most significant shipwreck discoveries of recent times. I oh, can't really read that. Can you move that? Yeah, thank you. So this is a quote. Sometimes an event occurs that, this is a quote by John Guy. Can you go back? Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. 
that dramatically enlarges the boundaries of our knowledge and raises our understanding of the realities of the past. It revealed the global scale of ancient commercial endeavours and the importance of the ocean to these trading networks. Um, but it also has a modern story to tell this shipwreck, which is what makes it so interesting. I wasn't so much interested in the art historical aspects of the objects found on board. I was interested in the sort of politics of what happened once it was um, discovered. Um, and what that tells us is about how nations appropriate the remnants of the past uh, for their own purposes and of the international debates about who owns and is responsible for shared heritage. So shared heritage here um, claimed by Oman or Yemen with Chinese cargo in Indonesian territorial waters. So my book is about the afterlives of this ship and its cargo. What we see here is a modern day replica made in 2010 in Oman and that's why Oman's got such a claim on the narrative here because they funded the reconstruction um, replica. Um, and my book really teases out the controversy that has discovered uh, that, that has accompanied its discovery and its display and the new knowledge it's brought to the surface about early maritime trade. Actually, it's a very significant wreck art historically, but it, it turned out to be one of the mo most controversial and contested shipwreck discoveries of recent times. And this is because um, it subverts the UNESCO model the model established by the 2001 UNESCO Convention on the Protection of the Underwater Cultural Heritage. Now, this model preferences in situ preservation as a first option and firmly opposes any commercial exploitation. And I'm aware, and I do talk about it in the book, that the wreck was found in 1998 and the UNESCO Convention was introduced in 2001. So one of the things Indonesia points to when pushing back on the criticism of what happened is that the convention wasn't in place yet. That's true, but the discussions were well advanced and there was certainly um, awareness in the international community um, about the direction that the, the community was moving in, in terms of protecting underwater cultural heritage. So it was discovered in 1998, as I said, and at this time in Indonesia, commercial salvage was legal. So because it was in territorial waters, um, Indonesia could do whatever it wanted to it. And at that time, um, since 1989, Indonesia had permitted the commercial salvage of um, underwater cultural heritage. And we can ask whether the Indonesian government's position on this was ideological, motivated by ideas around cultural ownership and value, and the fact that this wasn't considered an Indonesian shipwreck or whether it was purely a, a profit-driven approach that responded to the precedent set by other shipwrecks in Indonesian waters in the 1980s, um, which had been sold for many thousands of pounds at auction um, in Europe. So there was this, at this time in the, in the 1980s, 1980s and 1990s, an economic bounty on Chinese ceramics pulled from the sea in Indonesia. But either way, it created a situation where um, it was possible to extract wells from the ocean from wrecks by pulling them up. Not so much the hull, but the objects inside. So let's talk about the objects. Okay, here we go. Yes, so these are the beautiful waters of Blutung Island. Um, these are the black rocks uh, for which Blutung Island is famed. This is for you, Sabine. I didn't know you were joining, but I can tell you these are tektites. Um, and they are, well, you might correct me on this, but they're rocks that have been blasted by a meteor into space and then fallen back down to earth. So. When the ship was first found, it was called the Batu Hitam, which means black rock. Um, and then it was called the Blitung, and later it was renamed the Tan. <coughs> so it's under undergone this constant process of renaming um, and its identity has changed along the way. But anyway, that's my geological knowledge for Sabine. Love it, Natalie, thanks. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I've never had someone like Sabine on one of my talks before. <laughs> um, okay, we're gonna close, make that little. Oh, oh no, oh sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, so um, when when it was found, it was found by local fishers, as it normally is, sorry, Uni, um, and they talked of a reef where jars were, were growing. So the, the objects have been underwater for 1,100 years and have become very entangled with the wreck and the reef and, and the, you know, marine ecosystems that have grown around them. So they were down there looking for trepa, sea cucumber, and they started pulling up these jars, these 9th century jars. Um, and the objects are very compelling. Uh, I said there were an estimated, do we need other? Uh, res resume share, resume share. Um, there were an estimated 70,000 objects on board. Um, they recovered about 60,000. And most of the objects they recovered, some 55,000 objects, were these 
bowls that you see in the bottom left. These bowls from the kilns of Changsha in China, they're like little muesli bowls and you can imagine them in your hand or stacked on a kitchen shelf. Um, so you can see them here on the seabed uh, as they were shipped in these stacks um, and you can see them being uh, initial conservation and desalination taking place aboard the salvage boat when they were first brought to the surface. Um, can we go to the next? Okay, so uh, top left you can see the bowls, um, they are very beautiful and each one is different. Um, that constituted the bulk of the cargo, but some of the more spectacular objects you can see on the left hand side here is this one metre tall ewer, green splashed stone where it's got the lozenges at the base and these sort of floral incisions and uh, around the body of the ewer. Um, and the green splashed and the, the, the decorations tell us that it was destined for Middle Eastern market. So this idea started to form among the people who were bringing the objects up that the shipwreck, the vessel when it was sailing was traveling to the Middle East. Um, we can see here on the right, this magnificent um, octagonal oversized gold cup. Wouldn't be a real shipwreck without a bit of gold and silver to tie into what ChatGPT told us. Um, and on the side of it, we have um, a dancer. She looks like she's from Central Asia and seven musicians playing Central Asian instruments. So these really global tales um, through the objects. Uh, and there's been research done on the bowls, the chuncture bowls that I was talking about. and. There's evidence of pseudo script in these bowls. So speaking to Allah through the bowls, um, not representing Allah, but alluding to Allah through this pseudo script. script. So again, telling us that um, the final destination was the Middle Eastern market. Okay, next slide. Now on the left, these are amazing. Also from the same place that made the tall green splashed ewer, um, they produced these three blue and white plates. And these predate the famous China Jingzhiden ceramics, the blue and white that we all know China for, by five centuries. Um, so they're made on Chinese white clay um, and they're using cobalt from Central Asia and they're on this ship coming from China traveling to the Middle East. So it's this back and forth exchange of ideas and products. Um, top right you have some celadon um, and uh, bottom right is some whiteware. Um, these were likened to being like jade uh, in the former and like snow. Uh, in the latter. And apparently with the, the celadon, if you ring it, it sounds like jade as well. Um, if you've ever been brave enough to whack a 9th century celadon bowl, which I haven't, um, but apparently it resonates like jade. And these were um, part of the tea culture that was developing in China at the time. Um, so these are among the very, very prized objects on the ship, even though the bulk of it were the, the chuncture bowls. This, the, the chuncture bowls were like a floating Ikea. That's how somebody described <laughs> them to me. Um, so these multi-duplicate ceramics, which then in the future were to pose a big challenge for the people responsible for displaying those, those bowls in a way that was engaging to the public. Whereas these are the things that the connoisseurs are very interested in, the celadon, the whiteware, the green splash stoneware, and of course the blue and white. Um, okay, skipping ahead. It's very easy to get caught up in the objects because there's so many of them and they are so incredible. So on the top left, we have one of only three objects from the Middle East found on the wreck. So very few, very little evidence of anything from the Middle East on board. Um, but some objects that tell us about what life was like for the, the crew. Um, you can see in the hands here, this is someone holding star anise. So remarkable to think it survived for so long um, in this anaerobic uh, dark, lacking in oxygen environment underwater, undisturbed. Um, there's a symbol, there's a little uh, dog stoneware figure that was probably a personal um, trinket, um, perhaps carried by one of the crew members. And then we have these things like uh, bottom left and bottom right, we have a die, a bone die, and these game pieces in the shape of acorns. So these might have been things for passing the time on the ship. Uh, and then we have a scale, number five is a weighing scale for taking measurements probably of organic materials. And this sewing needle, which I really love because it might have been for um, sewing the sails, fixing the sails, that kind of thing. So skip ahead. So the main takeaway with the, um, the objects is that uh, they were multi-duplicate. The bulk of them were these chunks of wear, multi, you know, destined for the Middle Eastern market and a, a small um, number of objects belonging to the crew, um, a little bit of gold, a little bit of silver as well, which I haven't shown you. Um, so really every shipwreck is unique and this one was unique in how, how many of those bowls there were, 55,000. 
So what happened is they, they brought them up, they desalinated them over many years and conserved them, and then set about on this marketing campaign. And eventually Singapore purchased the objects. There was a bit of a, a tussle between who was going to get them. Um, Qatar was originally interested because it was going to, they wanted to use it to speak to their narratives of pearling, even though there were no pearls on the ship. Um, China, of course, the Shanghai Maritime Museum were desperate and through reasons I explain in the book, they missed out. Um, and Singapore was the lucky lucky buyer, and they bought it. They bought uh, fifty three thousand of the sixty thousand objects for thirty two US uh, thirty two million dollars uh, from the Indonesian government. Is that uh, from the salvage company. So um, under the arrangements of the commercial salvage, uh, the company and the Indonesian government had to split the profits 50-50, but through reasons too complicated to go into here, the salvage company managed to do a deal where they got the whole wreck and they said to the Indonesian government, we recently salvaged the Intan shipwreck. That one is much more relevant to Indonesian maritime histories. Why don't you take $2 million and the Intan shipwreck and let us keep the Blutong? And so that's what, what happened. So Indonesia ended up keeping the entirety of the Intan wreck, which was also found near Blutong Island, and a $2 million sweetener. Um, but there are these rumours that when the Indonesian government agreed to that deal, the salvage company, which had salvaged both of them and had both of them in its possession, didn't show Indonesia the, the plum objects from the Blutong, didn't show them the gold, the you are um, a lot of the unique objects. Just showed them all the brown chunks wear. And Indonesia, you know, this is Chinese. It's not relevant. Whereas the Intan objects really were they were they're remarkable for their diversity. There are so many different types of jewels and gemstones. So um, the salvage company, uh, you know, they were quite clever in their negotiations. And you can see the Intan shipwreck now. The um, Museum Keramik dan Seni Rupa in Jakarta, and it's not very well displayed. It's certainly not displayed the way that Singapore has got this wreck on display. So it's a bit of a sad tale about how Indonesia let it slip through its hands. But what it did mean is that the salvage company could keep the assemblage together, largely together, right? They, remember I said they brought up 60,000 objects, Singapore bought 53,000. Then there was this dispute with the Indonesian government and the Indonesian government seized 7,000 objects. And those objects are still in the shipwreck artifact warehouse in Indonesia, desperate for conservation. You know, these objects need care, they need, they need looking after, and they're in this big dusty warehouse that's really hot, really dry, it's got open windows and everything's covered in dust. So those 7,000 objects are still owned by the Indonesian government and they're not really sure what to do with them. So anyway, here they are in Singapore, um, and it took a long time for Singapore to figure out what narrative they were going to fit into, and eventually they renamed the shipwreck the Tung Shipwreck, and so that was a sign of where they were trying to fit it into these maritime Silk Road, um, you know, Pan-Asian, particularly Chinese um, narratives, in which Singapore was the centre of maritime history in Southeast Asia, not Indonesia, right? Um, and they partnered with the Smithsonian Institution to develop this big international travelling exhibition. And uh, that opened here at the Art Science Museum, this lotus-shaped uh, museum on the Singapore waterfront in 2011. And they produced the most beautiful catalogue, invested all their social, cultural, um, financial capital in this huge exhibition. Anyway, five months before it's due to open in Washington, the Smithsonian pulls the pin on it because of the um, commercial nature of the salvage. And what they said is that um, it was unscientifically um, salvaged by commercially motivated treasure hunters. So they're conflating um, treasure hunting and commercial salvage. So although it was technically legal, it is our position um, that the exhibition will serve to blur the distinction between genuine archaeology and treasure hunting. So five months is a very short lead time to cancel an exhibition. Um, and what they do instead is they announce they're going to re-excavate the site in Indonesia, which completely betrays uh, their lack of understanding about the Indonesian context. You need research permits, you need collaborators in Indonesia, and um, the Indonesians had already re-excavated the site the year before and had found it had been completely looted. Whatever was left on the seabed was gone. So the Smithsonian, it was a very hubristic um, response to this exhibition, 
and they allowed themselves to be influenced by these lobby groups um, who were really anti-treasure hunting and commercial salvage. Oh, sorry. So the question at the heart of my book is really, the shipwreck wasn't managed the way it should have been, but we do have this largely intact assemblage in Singapore today on permanent display at the Asian Civilizations Museum, where it can be accessed by members of the public, by scholars, um, and they've been conserved, they're beautifully displayed. Uh, so did the end justify the means when it came to this really controversial shipwreck? Here we go. Okay, so my book tries to navigate these polarised debates about how underwater cultural heritage should be managed um, between this purist approach that says the objects are better left in the water um, than be salvaged unscientifically uh, and versus the practical realities facing so many countries. So should the, the question is, should um, the objects have just been returned to the ocean floor, as one archaeologist suggested, as a disincentive for treasure hunting and commercial salvage? Or was it possible to develop an exhibition that uh, both disavowed looting while also ensuring the public's right to learn about and to access these, these um, underwater cultural her heritage objects? So the way I try to do that is to trace the biography of the ship and the objects um, and the people and the places that they've touched and been, that they've affected and been affected by. Um, I'm not an art historian and I'm not a maritime archaeologist either, so I'm a critical heritage studies scholar, which is a mouthful, and that's the approach I try to bring to thinking about these questions. Um, I also really wanted to foreground Southeast Asia within the book, um, so the choice of the book title, Blutung, was really intentional and I want, to, I want to get the book on sale at the Asian Civilizations Museum in Singapore, but they don't like the title because they've got the shipwreck on display as the tongue and they, they say to me, the audience isn't going to realise it's the same shipwreck. Um, but this was part of my effort to recenter Southeast Asia within the discussion and particularly Indonesia, uh, not China and not Singapore. Um, yeah, I did site visits and interviews with the commercial salvagers, as I mentioned before. That's me on my first visit to the museum um, many years ago. Um, and my main finding in response to this paradox about whether the end justified the means um, was that although the commercial salvage had its limitations and there really were a lot of problems with it, uh, it did give the Blutong objects another life. So if the shipwreck were discovered today, it's very uncertain what would happen. Um, Indonesia's commercial salvage legislation is in flux. There was a moratorium. That moratorium was overturned by the job creation law in 2020. Um, which reintroduced commercial salvage, but then the Constitutional Court has said that the job creation law is not constitutional, so there's there's just no clarity about whether commercial salvage is legal in Indonesia or not. Do you have an update on that law? Well, it hasn't been decided yet. No, it hasn't been. So, so who knows what's happening with the shipwrecks while that's been decided. I think they've got until the end of next year to determine if the job creation law is constitutional or not. So even my collaborators in the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries are not sure what would happen if a shipwreck was found today and if someone tried to apply for a survey and salvage licence. Um, so I think, you know, the uncertainty around the fate of shipwrecks like this in Indonesia really has grave implications for the archipelago's many thousands of shipwrecks at a time when um, you know, knowledge of the archipelago's maritime histories is so overshadowed by the powerful political narratives evoked by the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, I also think there are implications for other orphaned objects. So this is a collection um, that uh, we're working on as part of an ARC linkage project. It was collected by um, a KC, used to be a QC, but he's a KC now. Um, and he always wanted to be an archaeologist, but he's, he's old and retired now. So he's donated his entire collection purchased at the antiquities markets of Jakarta to this ARC project. And we are trying to determine the provenance and provenience of these um, orphaned objects. And many of them are from shipwrecks, but we don't know which ones. So where does that leave these objects? Um, should they be displayed? There was a lot of resistance from Flinders Uni to taking the objects on um, without the big research project around it. So lots of um, implications for these many orphaned uh, objects. And the question is, you know, where is the line for us as scholars in conducting research and sharing this information with the public and in legitimising unethical collecting practices that destroy archaeological and historical context? 
So in the process of um, researching the wreck, um, I came across lots of criticism and controversies and rumours, um, which I won't go into too much detail here. Um, they're all in the book. Some of them were justified. Some of the criticisms that objects were buried in the sand, I think, actually did happen. Um, but some of them, you know, a lot of the criticism was around the fact that the hull was left in situ and, and that's a key piece of maritime archaeological information. Uh, and so for the commercial salvages to leave that in the water meant that they weren't serious about the excavation. But what I found in my research is that Indonesia had required them to leave it in the water with this um, poorly thought out idea of develop it, developing it into a tourism site. And with timber wrecks in particular in tropical waters, as soon as you expose them and interfere with them, they just get destroyed by Torito worms, the, the mollusks that eat timber. Um, what's more is there was a lot of looting on the site while it was being salvaged and post salvage because local communities knew that gold was coming up out of the water. So when the salvage finished, people were down there with big sticks breaking it all apart. And we know that by 2010, there was absolutely nothing left. So this idea of leaving the hull in situ, yes, um, they did do that, but they were required to by the Indonesian government and really the responsibility was with the Indonesian government to think through that maritime tourism idea a lot better than they did. Um, and then, you know, one of the things that is often said about this assemblage, this collection on display at the Asian Civilizations Museum, these 53,000 objects, is that it's intact, you know. A lot of the criticisms around treasure hunting are that things are split up and separated from their context. Um, but we have this intact assemblage, or do we, right? So there were about 70,000 objects on board, about 60,000 objects salvaged, and about 10,000 objects were left on the seabed. They were too concreted to remove. They had no financial value, might have been a reason as well. Um, so there were many objects left on the seabed. So. 53,000 were sold to Singapore, as I've mentioned, and as you can see, most of them are these juncture balls. Um, 7,000 objects were seized by Indonesian authorities. I did this amazing project during COVID where we did a maritime archaeology um, webinar with students from across Indonesia, including in Jakarta, and we managed to organise site visits for all of them in Makassar, um, for the students in Makassar, in Jakarta, for those students at UI, and um, to a museum in Jogja for the students at UGM. And so this is the students from UI uh, and Untirta, which is uh, in Bantan Bay near Jakarta. Uh, they visited the shipwreck artifact warehouse and got to do some measurements of the 7,000 objects that the, the government still holds. So that was, that was great, a bit of um, education and capacity building um, did come about through those objects. Um, but there are still objects turning up. So 162 objects were recent, well, in 2017, were sold to China by a private owner. And as we know that the hull is destroyed and the anchor is missing. Um, there was an early photograph of the anchor, but no one's ever seen the anchor again. So who's got it, we don't know. Uh, and there are still objects in private collections. So I recently became aware of this very beautiful bowl. And I don't know if you can make this out, but it's a sea monster. Here's a big sea, scary ski monster attacking a dhow, attacking a ship. Um, so this is one of the most beautiful juncture bowls. Uh, and this is in a private collection in, in Singapore. And um, our own Chow Chak Wing has been offered some bowls that certainly look like they're from Blue Tong. They might not be, but given the concretions and the type of bowl, there's a possible, possibility. Um, now this donor approached the Chow Chak Wing Museum. The museum, um, put the donor in touch with me and I contacted them and then the conversation never went any further. Um, so I don't know what's happening with those ones. Um, and the other, uh, you know, thing that is still being discussed by experts is where the shipwreck came from. So this is the sister ship found in Thailand. It dates to the same period. It's exactly the same construction, slightly larger. And the interesting thing about this shipwreck, um, the Panom Surin, is that they have been able to do definitive analysis of the, the materials used to construct this wreck, and they are all from Southeast Asia. 
So there's no chance that this was made in the Middle East. It was definitely made in Southeast Asia. And given its similarities to the Blitung, it is raising a lot of questions about uh, where Blitung was made and whether there were these skilled teams of shipwrights and shipbuilders working in Southeast Asia. That's super interesting. Uh, what I left out, um, I'm working on this idea at the moment because uh, I've been overly influenced by colleagues in anthropology um, about the multi-species shipwreck. So in my book, I don't talk at all about what happened between when the ship sank in probably 826, 827 AD and 1998 when it was found by the um, fishes. So I'm interested in exploring that and I've just written a journal article about this and it's been accepted so it will be out soon. Um, and I've chosen this beautiful picture here of the concretion on one of these green splashed stem cups um, which have a tube up the side and um, for drinking they were like uh, original keep cups with built-in straws, very beautiful and to cover the hole where the straw comes out each cup has a little animal, whether it's a fish or a turtle or, or something else. Um, and, and I chose that photo because of the beautiful concretions there. So I'm interested in thinking more about those 1100 years underwater and what happens to a ship and the marine ecosystems around it. And where does this leave us? Oh, the significance, right. Um, so where are we? Okay, so in terms of this specific case study, I've tried to tell the full story of the shipwreck from many different perspectives. Um, some people, some of my colleagues um, don't believe it deserves research attention and that to look at this shipwreck is to legitimise unethical practices when it comes to shipwreck management. But for me, it raised a lot of questions about how heritage is, is created and claimed and conceptualised. And I think uh, even though it poses a threat to these established approaches and these international standards, it also presents new ways of thinking about protection and preservation in an underwater context and really lays bare that paradox that I outlined earlier, which is that although it was managed contrary to the international standards, it is largely intact and publicly accessible. So what allowance, if any, do existing frameworks make for such an outcome? Can orphaned objects be accommodated in circumstances where the benefits of recovering the objects outweigh the costs? And if not, what is the cost of such a rigid adherence to ethical principles? I think my book also tries to make a correction in critical heritage studies as a field of research, which is really dominated by terrestrial approaches. Um, so the ocean is 70% of the planet. My argument is that if you're not thinking about heritage in the ocean, you're missing most of the story. Um, and it really does raise these big questions about transnational heritage, um, shared heritage, about ownership, rights and responsibility, and connects to these bigger issues around livelihoods, tourism, um, and making claims on the past. So I want to come back to this idea of using shipwrecks as a vessel for exploring these bigger issues around inequality and exploration and geographies of empathy and so on. So I'm going to wrap up here. but. Um, before I do, let me first remind you of one of the biggest ocean stories of the past few months. Can anyone, anyone remember a big ocean story from the past couple of months? So you've looked at my slides, so you're not allowed to say it. Yeah, the Titanic. Very good. Tight, the Titan submersible, yeah, exactly. So this was the, I'm referring here to the implosion of Ocean Gate's experimental submersible, the Titan lost on an experimental combined tourism research visit to RMS Titanic, four kilometres below the surface in international waters. So OceanGate, the company, is based in the US. Um, the submersible is registered in the Bahamas. The launch vessel was Canadian flagged. And those who were on board were from England, Pakistan, France and the US. And they'd all paid a lot of money for this science tourism experience. Can anyone think of the other big ocean story that was unfolding at exactly the same time? This was the refugee. Yes, yeah. Kevin. That's right. Um, the unnamed boat off the coast of Greece, which is believed to have been carrying more than 750 people when it sank, <laughs> most, most of whom were never found. So those on board are believed to be, though we don't really know, to believed to be from Syria, Egypt, Pakistan and Palestine people in desperate situations with sick children and families to support. And reading the stories of why people got on board that ship is um, absolutely heartrending. 
Um, the registration of the vessel isn't known, but it departed from Libyan waters and sank in international waters off the coast of Greece. And interestingly, when I was doing this slide, it's very easy to find a photo of the Titan submersible. You can have your pick. There are hundreds of photos of it. That's about the only photo I could find of the unnamed boat um, that sank off Greece. So we're getting a sense here of uh, media attention um, on these very, two very different maritime shipwreck issues. So, you know, the, cover, the, the difference in their coverage was absolutely stark. We saw a juxtaposition between the rolling media coverage of Titan. Um, BBC had a dedicated live stream channel for a while. Um, and, and this valorization of submarine exploration and conquest with all the colonial baggage that those terms carry. And of course, the ongoing fetishization of the world's most famous shipwreck, Titanic despite there being no more archaeological or historical benefit to returning to this site over and over again. Meanwhile, you have the half-hearted coverage of the refugee boat, filled with people not embarking on exploration or tragedy tourism, but fleeing poverty, war, persecution and the effects of climate change. And we have these inadequate rescue efforts, despite the Mediterranean being one of the busiest bodies of water in the world, um, all against a backdrop in which ship's captains, um, who have historically rendered assistance to those in peril on the sea, um, have actually uh, been prosecuted for assisting refugee boats in the Mediterranean. So even though my research into Belitung offered rich insights into the historical and archaeological aspects of Quebec, um, what I'm really interested in and want to leave you with today is the politics of shipwrecks and what they can tell us about the world, how it is and how we imagine it to be. Thank you.